As we gather, I invite us to begin by remembering and giving thanks this morning for the life of Senator Murray Sinclair, who was chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and who died this past week. The TRC revealed the truth of the residential schools and their legacy and put before Canadians 94 calls to action to help us live into reconciliation with the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And so today we give thanks for the life and witness of Murray Sinclair as we hold his family in our prayers. May his memory continue to inspire us to carry on that work of truth and reconciliation in this land. I'll invite you to remain seated as you join me in our opening responses for our gathering right for Advent. God of time and God of eternity, for you we wait. God of outer space and God closer than we can imagine. God of the roaring noise of the world and God of silence. In our homes, classrooms, factories, offices and fields. In this place and in this time. darkness of waiting we wait for the hungry to be fed for freedom for all for the weapons of war to be abolished for everyone to have clean water and sanitation for an end to suspicion between Christian Muslim and Jew for peace in our world and yet while we wait for your kingdom to come, you have already welcomed us in. You have already shown us what is required. May this candle be a beacon that guides us in preparing your way, even as we wait. Amen. As we're using uh, the narrative lectionary for our Sunday morning readings here this fall, we're still going to be continuing through with stories from the Hebrew scriptures through our extended Advent season. And it's important to talk about or to, to understand that these texts are both sacred texts, uh, not only for us as Christians, but certainly also for the Jewish community. And that these stories hold uh, particular and different meanings for our Jewish siblings than maybe they do for us. Because for us as Christians, um, we are always looking at these stories and also reading them through the lens of Jesus's story. And that is good um, and appropriate for us to do that. And it's just important to acknowledge that's not the only way of looking at these stories. Um, as we're heading towards uh, Christmas and the Advent promise of Christ's return, one of the ways, again, this year, we're going to help us make these connections between Jesus' story and these stories from the Hebrew scriptures is to use uh, a chrisman tree. 
So we have our little tree again here, and if you've been around back, you can see I've already hung some, some of our ornaments from last year. We're gonna be adding new ones this season, and I wanna thank Jean Lepinen, who did the work of making them for us. I'm very grateful for that, Jean. Um, for those who maybe don't remember or don't know, chrisman trees don't have a super, super long history. Um, they date from the 1950s, and it was a particular church, Ascension Lutheran Church, in Danville, Virginia, that um, started this as a tradition. The word chrisman is made up of the word Christ and monogram, and so putting those together, you get chrisman, and they're all symbols that represent something about Jesus. So this morning, the chrisman that we're gonna add to our tree is this one. You can see that, we've got a fish here. Fish was a very early symbol for Christ. Uh, the Greek word for fish is ichthus, um, and it's an acrostic. So for early Christians, you guys know, remember your poetry in high school, what an acrostic is, right? The first, so you take a word, and each letter of that word then represents another word. So the words ichthus um, in Greek, and I'm not going to do the Greek translation. G, you could probably do this for us <laughs> this morning. <laughs> um, but the English ichthus, each letter stands for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And so um, there's tradition that says often Christians would draw that symbol in, you know, in the dirt or, or somewhere to identify other Christians because it wasn't um, as obvious a symbol as, say, a cross, right? It was a little bit of a safer symbol um, in terms of communicating and identifying who other Christians were. Um, also, I mean, if we think of Jesus as ministry, there are stories in the New Testament that include fish, right? Certainly maybe think of Jesus feeding the multitudes with, with fish and a few loaves of bread. Um, Jesus calling the disciples to come and be fishers of people. I'm curious, can you think of any stories from the Hebrew scriptures that include a fish? Why would we maybe be thinking about a fish today? Sometimes we maybe think of it not as a fish, but uh, a whale. <laughs> All right, Jonah and the whale. Although in the translation we're going to read this morning, it does talk about being a great fish. All right, but I think that's a story many of us know. Um, if we grew up going to Sunday school, we would have heard about Jonah right, being swallowed by the whale. Um, God calls Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh to repent of their evil ways. Jonah runs the other way, right, uh, and goes in a boat, a great storm comes up, Jonah ends up overboard, and he gets swallowed, right? Swallowed by this fish, by this whale for three days, who eventually spits him up on dry land. Um, it doesn't get Jonah off the hook, though, right? God <laughs> tells him to keep going. And that's, so, that's the familiar part of the story, I think, right? We know the part about Jonah getting swallowed by the whale. Uh, we're going to hear the second part um, in our scripture story today, which I think is less familiar to many of us, right? What happens after Jonah got spit up by the whale? And it's a story, um, we'll hear about this invitation to think about God's mercy, right? Just how big God's love is for the world, much bigger than our capacity often, um, and to think about how God is inviting us to join in sharing this love with everyone, not just those who are easy for us to love. Um, I was hoping I might have a little person here this morning, but we don't have any, any young kids. Do I have a volunteer? Who would like to put our first chrisman up on the tree today? Come on. Oh, Austin. Awesome. There, and I'll move out of the way so that Lori can get a good view of the tree for the folks on Zoom. Thanks, Austin. I'll let you pick the spot that you think is best there. Thank you. Please join me in a word of prayer. You are the God of all power, working wonders among the peoples. You take our tiny contribution, even the smallest of our efforts, and use them to expand your kingdom. Make us ready today to play our part, even when we can't see what good it will do. 
trusting that your will for all creation will be fulfilled. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our acclamation. A reading from Jonah, chapters 3 and 4. May we be equipped by these words to walk in love for God, ourselves, our neighbours, all people, and all God's creation. The Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it the proclamation that I am commanding you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh, according to the Lord's word. Now Nineveh was indeed an enormous city, a three days walk across. Jonah started into the city, walking one day, and he cried out, just 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on mourning clothes from the greatest of them to the least significant. When the word of it reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, stripped himself of his robe, covered himself with mourning clothes and sat in ashes. Then he announced, in Nineveh by decree of the king and his officials, neither human nor animal, cattle nor flock will taste anything, no grazing and no drinking water. Let humans and animals alike put on mourning clothes and let them call upon God forcefully and let all persons stop their evil behavior and the violence that's under their control. He thought, who knows, God may see this and turn from his wrath so that we might not perish. God saw what they were doing, that they had ceased their evil behavior. So God stopped planning to destroy them and he didn't do it. But Jonah thought this was utterly wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, come on Lord, wasn't this precisely my point when I was back in my own land? This is why I fled to Tarshish earlier. I know that you are merciful and a compassionate God, very patient, full of love, and willing not to destroy. At this point, Lord, you may as well have taken my life from me, because it would be better for me to die than to live. The Lord responded, Is your anger a good thing? But Jonah went out from the city and sat down east of the city. There he made himself a hut and sat under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a shrub and it grew up over Jonah, providing shade for his head and saving him from his misery. Jonah was very happy about the shrub, but God provided a worm the next day at dawn and it attacked the shrub so that it died. Then as the sun rose, God provided a dry east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. He begged that he might die, saying, it's better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, is your anger about the shrub a good thing? Jonah said, yes, my anger is good, even to the point of death. But the Lord said, you pitied the shrub for which you didn't work and didn't raise. It grew in a night and perished in a night. Yet for my part, can't I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. God's story, our story. Thanks be to God. In order for us, uh, in order for us to understand why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh, we need to know something about uh, the time in which the story is set and about the Assyrian Empire. 
So at this time, Assyria controlled most of the Near East, and Nineveh was the capital city of this great empire. And as we're told in the story, its people were in desperate need of a change of heart. In history, there's actually historical evidence to this point um, that the Ninevites, we know, were, were proud killers of Judeans. A couple of centuries ago, archaeologists actually discovered some wall panel reliefs that illustrate some of the Assyrian sieges. And these gory images depict Judeans being impaled and their heads placed on stacks for all to see. Um, so some very real, uh, real violence. When, when God calls Jonah to go there, to go to Nineveh, into that center of corrupt power, into that place of stomach-churning violence, to preach a word of repentance, I think we can understand, knowing that context, why Jonah says, no way, right? At best, the people will ignore him. At worst, they will kill him, right? He might end up like one of those um, impaled on those um, uh, sticks. There's also a third possibility that becomes clear as we hear this story. Something else that Jonah is worried about, and it's that the Ninevites, these Judean killers, they might actually repent, right? And then God, who is gracious and merciful, would forgive them, and that then Jonah would have to do the same. And he's, he's just not ready to go there. And that's why Jonah runs away in the complete opposite direction from Nineveh. He wants to get as far away from there as possible. And, and who can really fault him for that? It is no small ask to show love to those who very clearly have shown how much they hate your people. And this is where the familiar story that I talked about a little bit earlier comes in with the storm and the fish, right? Jonah is running away from Nineveh. He hops on a boat to get even further away. A great storm comes up. Jonah ends up overboard, gets swallowed by this fish where he spends three days in the belly of this fish. And when the fish finally spits Jonah up, on the shore, God comes calling again, telling Jonah where he's supposed to go. And this time Jonah thinks twice about disobeying God's call. Begrudgingly, he does make his way to Nineveh, where he issues that call to repentance. To Jonah's surprise and very clearly his disappointment, right, the king and along with all the people of Nineveh, they listen to him, right? They listen to this one guy who comes to this great city. Immediately, they turn from their wicked ways, they repent, and just as Jonah feared, what does God do? God forgives them. Jonah, however, cannot find it within himself to do the same, right? He is so angry he tells God he just wishes he were dead. And that's where the story ends, right? Like it felt like a really strange ending where Kim stopped reading, but that is the end of Jonah's story, right? These repentant Ninevites who don't know their right hand from their left, I don't know, that was an interesting uh, characterization of them, but repentant Ninevites and a Jonah who is determined to go to his grave holding on to this hatred for the Ninevites, the end. Not the outcome I'm sure God was hoping for, for Jonah, and certainly there, there could have been, there must be another way for a story like that to go. In 1991, Rabbi Michael Weiser, along with his family, moved from New York City to Lincoln, Nebraska, where he was taking on a new position at South Street Temple. And one Sunday morning, a few days after they had moved, their phone rang. The man on the other end of the line called Rabbi Weiser, Jew boy, and told him he would be sorry he'd moved in. 
And two days later, a thick package of anti-black, anti-Semitic pamphlets arrived in the mail, including an unsigned card that read, the KKK is watching you, scum. The police suggested that the caller and antagonist was very likely a man named Larry Trapp, who was the local grand dragon of the KKK chapter of Nebraska. And Trapp, as it happens, was also a double amputee. He'd lost his legs um, to advanced diabetes at a young age. You can imagine Weiser was very worried for his family, but he decided to take a, a different approach rather than ignoring um, what was happening. He sought out this man, Trapp's phone number from a friend, and began leaving phone messages on his answering machine. So things like, Larry, there's a lot of love out there. You're not getting any of it. Don't you want some? Or, Larry, the very first law that the Nazis passed were against people like yourself who have physical disabilities, and you would have been among those to die under the Nazis. Why do you love the Nazis so much? It turned into a regular routine. Weiser would call every Thursday. Usually he got the machine, but one time uh, Trapp did answer the call. He answered by screaming profanities and asking Weiser what he wanted, why he kept calling. Weiser replied that he knew Trapp was disabled. He offered to give him a ride to the grocery store. Trapp told him he was all set and said not to call anymore. But Weiser kept calling, leaving these messages of love. And then one day, his own phone rang, and it was Trapp who asked, is this the rabbi? I want to get out of what I'm doing, and I don't know how. Despite warnings from his family, Weiser decided to go and visit Trapp in his home. He went that night to break bread, and when he showed up, he thought he had made a very grave mistake because Trapp answered the door in his wheelchair with, with three guns in his lap. But then Trapp reached out his hand, introduced himself, and burst into tears. After talking for hours, Weiser learned of the severe emotional and physical abuse that Trapp had suffered at the hands of his father. It became clear to him that Trapp's hateful actions were a manifestation of never having felt loved. And over the next year, Trapp became a fixture in the community. He went out seeking to make amends, talking to groups about the perils of hatred. And around this time, his own health started to deteriorate. Surprising everybody in the community, Rabbi Weiser and his family invited Trapp to come and live with them. And so he did. Trapp stayed with them for a year until he, he, he passed away. He died a year later. But during that time, Trapp also converted to Judaism. And the day of his funeral, the synagogue was packed with people who would never have expected to have been there a few years earlier. You could say, we look at Jonah's story and Rabbi Weiser's story. These are both about loving your enemies. But I think there's an important qualification or nuance to, to talk about with this. Because I think at least for, for many of us, when we talk about enemies, we tend to think that those are people that we dislike, right? And that well, maybe I don't have any enemies, right? I like everyone. Um, and certainly there's an element of that in this story, right? It certainly was true for Jonah and the Ninevites. He, there was no love lost there. Jonah did not like the Ninevites. But I think maybe if we want to be more accurate, these are stories that are about loving those who hate you, right? Loving those who hate you, right? And that's something that Jesus spoke about in his Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus said, you've heard it said that you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you, right? Pray for those who harass you. 
It is a call to love those who hate. And that is a Christian calling. But I know for many of us, being hated in that way is something that we're privileged not to have experienced firsthand. It's not true for all of us, but it is true, I think, for many of us here. Right? It is a privilege not to have these kinds of enemies, to not have people who hate you because of something that is beyond your control, right? like the color of your skin, your sexual orientation or gender identity, your nationality, your immigration status, the accent of your speech. I think it can be hard to appreciate the fear that goes along with this if you're not a part of a marginalized group in that way. I know there's a lot of, of folks in the U.S. who do not feel safe after last week's election. I know there's a lot of people here in our own country that don't feel safe these days because of the increasing anti-immigrant, anti-trans, anti-gay um, rhetoric that is just getting louder and louder, it seems. Jesus calls us to love those who hate, but it's important to name that, that doing that is not easy and it's certainly not risk-free. Right? And so I think sometimes, often, perhaps, like Jonah, we will really struggle to live into that call, to meet hate with love. Right? We will fail to speak up often enough, strongly enough, to call uh, to account, to repentance, those who spout off um, this kind of hateful language and do hateful actions. And that's often because, as I said, there is very real risk in doing that, right? Especially if that is aimed at you personally. Sometimes I wonder, I hope like Rabbi Weiser, uh, we might actually muster up the courage to face hate with mercy, love, and grace. And his story is one that I heard a few years ago, and it just um, blew me away. I can't, I, I mean, I have a hard time imagining being able to confront that kind of direct personal hate with, with love and mercy and grace the way that he did. And not every story likely has the same ending that his story did. I can only imagine that for him being a rabbi, um, a person of faith, that it was stories of his faith, stories like Jonah's story that teaches about God's expansive mercy that sustained him and helped him persevere in reaching out in love to his enemy. Meeting hate with love is risky, and yet it's so important when we can do it, right? To recognize and honor our shared humanity. Because when we are able to do that, that is where there is possibility for transformation, where there is possibility for repentance. These stories, Jonah and Rabbi Weiser, they teach us never to count anyone out. Even though, uh, you know, it would be nice, <laughs> but like Jonah, we're not going to get results nearly as quickly as he did or as easily as Jonah did. That's not probably our reality. In Advent, in this season of the church, we pay special attention of, of waiting, of longing for that day when God's vision of unity is fulfilled when the lion will lay down with the lamb, to use a biblical image. And as we wait for God to act, God is also waiting for us to do that hard work of honoring one another's humanity, even those who hate us or hate those we love. To love even through our fear the way that God loves every human on this planet, and to know that when we can't do that, that God loves them. God loves them even when we are not yet in a place to be able to do that. Thankfully, God's grace and mercy and love are far, far more expansive than our own. God's mercy is big enough for our enemies. It's big enough for us when we find ourselves like Jonah, struggling to Show love to those who hate. God of Advent, give us courage to meet hate with love. 
soften our hearts to always see the humanity in one another so that hearts and minds might be transformed by your expansive love. Amen. Our hymn of the day, uh, again, is coming from All Creation Sings. It's number 1062, Build a Longer Table. I'll invite you to stand and sing uh, together as you are able. Dorothy Day once wrote, people say, what is the sense of our small effort? They cannot see that we must lay one brick at a time, take one step at a time. A pebble cast into a pond causes ripples that spread in all directions. Each one of our thoughts, words, and deeds is like that. No one has a right to sit down and feel hopeless. There is too much work to do. Trusting that God can maximize even your small effort, go live for God's kingdom first, bearing the blessing of God's mercy for this world God so loves. And may the God of endings and beginnings, God in the darkness and the light, God our hope for the journey, bless and keep you now and forever. Amen. Amen.